Everyone is welcome here, it's time to make new friends. Fill your Glen Carrot. Share a dram with the spirit of Edmonton. Luncha! Luncha. Doesn't that make you feel like throwing down your your Glencarn glass and just slapping it down? Well, you have to finish it first. Here we are. Good day, whiskey brothers, whiskey sisters, whiskey friends, and welcome to the Whiskey Book Club's third book of the season with this gentleman right over here, the Dr. Don, the incomparable Dr. Don Livermore, the author of this book right here. Well, this is the one that we're doing, Blending 101. The Canadian Whiskey Masterclass. And uh, there's still time to get that for Christmas. And if you wanted two books instead of one, because maybe one's not enough to give to the loved ones, there's the first one. Oh, so, yeah. uh, and, and you should read both. The History First, and then Into the Blending 101. So Volume 2 is what we're doing today. And as always, I'm honored to have you, the viewer, with us today. Uh, Merry Christmas. And I'm going to take off the hat. So this is cute for a second, but then it gets a bit obnoxious afterwards. So there we are. A uh, little bit of information. There's other whiskey book clubs out there, but none that delve so deeply into the topic with the author than we do right here. And my name's Dolph. I'm Prezi Alberta Scott Sadi, but I'm founder of the Whiskey Book Club. I'm your host tonight. We're here, Dr. Don, and later on some, uh, some other distillers with us for the after dram. But those of you new to us, I'll tell you a little bit what the Whiskey Book Club's about. It is a home base. It's a safe place uh, for whiskey geeks that love to share a dram and love to read, mostly about whiskey, whiskey-related activities. And this book, I'll show it to you again. That book right there is the 14th book reviewed on the Whiskey Book Club. And it's also the second of two books, like I just said, that Dr. Don's authored. And that came out in October, Don. Yep, October, October 4th, J.P. Weiser's birthday. October 4th. Oh, mm -hmm. perfect date. You love your dates. <laughs> and, and we're going to talk I about do the I like, the, like Easter eggs and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You do. It's, it's good. And as you've seen, there's Dr. Don. He's been the, the master blender since 2012. Uh, but it all started at University of Waterloo. He had his bachelor of science 1995 specialized in microbiology 1996 he starts with Heron walker and he made a main name for himself right away and then got his doctor's degree doctorate masters and doctorate of distilling fall at Heret watt university in edinburgh where he focused his attention on wood aging process wood and the aging process both together Don, welcome what you got in your glass tonight, everybody? Thank you, Dolph. Uh, you know what? You inspired me uh, to go back to our whiskey tasting this summer, Dolph. And uh, I had a little bit of the sample that I sent out to your uh, Alberta Scotch Society. I am drinking Lot 40 uh, aged in black sea casks. Excellent. Great minds think alike there, Don, because I'm drinking three of them that you sent this summer to the tasting. So number one, this will go down pretty quick. So the red letter was was one we had. That's I don't know if that was the very first in our tasting. It was right up there. And then a uh, lot 40 Black Sea and then the lot 40 quarter cask. So it's a lot 40 night. And there's a reason for that, Don. You made an announcement today. that I think Yes. Probably since uh, the first time since 1890 the time where we probably sold whiskey by the barrel. That's when the, the yep. aging law came into effect. We have sold a fir our first single cask. Or we, we will tomorrow. Uh, for, if the, if people can... are picking this up, December 18th, we're going to sell. And it's a, an announcement uh, uh, through my social media platforms today. And it's a lot 40, 18 year old cask strength. 154 yeah. bottles were bottled and uh, 18 will go on sale. Uh, first come first serve. Uh, you got to go through thedropcollective.ca uh, and be quick on the button because it's going to be at 1818 Eastern Standard Time on December 18th. I think you're catching the theme here, Dolph. <laughs> yep. Even yeah. for me, I can do it. The math teacher, the quad 18s, that were good. And uh, so, hey, what a beautiful whiskey. Yeah, I hope you can get a chance to try it and taste it. It's one extraordinary whiskey, as you can imagine. Oh. I, I don't know if there's any 18-year-old rye barrels out there at all. I, I was trying to think about that today. If there's anything that old uh, with 100% rye out there, not sure. 
but it's, There's it's the cool, 20 to say and 22 year old Canadian club. That's about it. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure if it's hundred percent Ryan. If it is awesome. There's not too many. There's not too many out there. There's not too many out there is the point. Well, and you, I think you've got to be one of them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's such a co cool thing to do. I, I've been sitting on this for a year and a half, keeping my mouth shut. <laughs> I, knew this was coming. Yeah, I, I knew it was coming. I have, I didn't, I usually I do tests and learns and things. This one, I just knew it, it was going to be, I didn't need, I didn't need to test. <laughs> I knew it was okay. going to be, or will be probably an extraordinary success and, uh, hopefully more to come Dolph. I hope we can do some more single barrel releases. We'll see how this goes. Um, and I, I love to s hear your audience opinion. If they even type them in the comments, uh, that, uh, would we like to see more single barrel, uh, releases from the higher Walker distillery? Uh, I'm quite anxious to see, see how it goes. I'm, I'm sure it's going to go well. It's going to sell out. It'd be neat. You should find out how many minutes though it takes to sell out there tomorrow. The 1818 because A 18 not, seconds. <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Or 18 minutes, 18 seconds. Give us a bit of time. I'll be on 418 my time. So it's, it's yeah. six or 1818 your time. 1618 for me. Yeah. And uh, how many bottles are you selling right away again? The first 18, uh, just 18, the first day, just to get get uh, an early uh, look at it, early Christmas present. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the rest will go on sale. And the, the remainders will be a lottery, uh, probably post-Canadian Whiskey Awards. We're not sure of the date yet. Uh, it'll probably just be something sometime shortly thereafter. And uh, put your put your name. And the, the kicker is you got to, we can only ship to an Ontario address. So, we all have friends in Ontario. It's a big province. <laughs> a lot of people. It's good. There you go. So that that good. that's the thing. That's uh, I don't make the laws or we don't make the rules. That's the way it is when we when we do single cask releases, and it's the most efficient way we can get it out there. And I'm sure people will be creative in how they can acquire one of these bottles. It's gonna go well. And yeah, like, every one of us has friends. We don't want to call them mules. They're they're <laughs> friends. They're, they're they're people we take advantage of. And you know what? Being here in Alberta, uh, they've taken advantage of the Alberta. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's it's very reciprocal. Believe. That sounds like a show for another day about uh, shipping uh, alcohol across borders in Canada. Sure. Right. <laughs> and I won't be able to publish it. We'll talk, <laughs> but we won't be able to say anything. And this is us. It's nothing yeah, you'll need mind. somebody from the government to see what they'd have to say on it. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I, I really love it. And you know what? You guys adapt to the times, and, and you do. And I think the single barrel I've been talking about forever, it, it's what I like best. I do. Cast yeah. drink single barrels my, is, is my cup of tea. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. If you could say that. There. Yeah. So uh, let's jump into this because uh, we're starting with Chapter 6. We're doing Chapter 6 to Chapter 9. I'm really happy I didn't do this last week because this was my favorite chapter and i think three quarters are questions that i wrote down for you all from this one chapter so i wouldn't have known where to stop actually um but we get an even closer look at the lives of the master blenders which is really nice uh, so this next quote prompts a question in relation to possible schisms from one to another so this uh, hopefully i piqued your interest in a couple schisms here we go okay when you see that so sometimes issues arise only once in a career and as a master blender you either have to remember the solution to the problem from listening to previous master blenders easy enough or you have to have the skill set to deal with the problem and add it to your story and be able to transfer it to the next in line and i agree it makes sense you either have to know it or you have to have the chops to deal with it so okay. this is the reason why careers as master blenders or master distillers are so long in order to maintain the knowledge of the past it is priceless so that's your quote from top to bottom uh but i'm gonna say not all and did you see the water of life film don uh, it was about uh, no i have not no no I, i'm aware of what the film is but i have not seen it all right where well, there's okay. a scene that made me kind of angry a little bit because adam uh he receives the recipe for black arts 5.1 4.1 was the very last one his predecessor did and i'm not going to talk too much about them but i'm going to say he gets the recipe for 5.1 the next year for black arts he's gone he's gone through the distillery he's picked out uh the barrels that he thinks should go into this next blend and he gives it to him so this little piece of paper and he said because they're in a viewing adam then and he takes it he crumples it up throws it in the garbage so i i'm thinking relationships are complex so between the previous master blender master distiller to the new master blender and master distillers but uh 
maybe he needed to get out from under the shadow of his previous master blender distiller at best points because they do both and i'm thinking maybe kind of father son type maybe or a little bit of competition there so without getting too personal with you what was it like in relation to your predecessor was there a little bit of friction you just want to show off your chops or I i'm wondering I, I think each master blender deals with the issue of the era, uh, quite honestly. Um, in my first book, when, when you do read The Keeper of History, I talk about the lineage of master blenders and what they bring to the table. Um, I, I, I Kind of the master blender role started in Hiram Walker, probably post-prohibition, because up to that point, it was like the Wild West. Uh, it, it was it was written down, it was, <laughs> but it was just Wild West um, kind of thing. But the first guy in line, his issue was to, to, to make whiskey in a controlled engineered fashion his name was cs biroff and uh, cs was probably in charge of the uh, uh for about over 30 years brilliant man he, he had a phd as well he had a whole engineering staff working on them but he brought technology to the business uh the next one after him um he he carried it on uh but he had to deal with a closure of of a distillery uh, in Priori, Illinois, moving everything to Walkerville, yes. where we are today. Uh, so he had to deal with some of those issues there. And he actually dealt with a emerging drink strategy well, because he had to deal with liqueurs and, and things of that nature, because okay. they weren't really around. But he, he was the guy that started developing the higher market liqueur line, if any Americans are looking into that. Um, the next guy after that, Mike Booth. Uh, people probably will recognize that name a little bit. Uh, Mike, yep. uh, he, uh, he dealt with contraction in the 80s. There was a health kick and people weren't drinking the Cosmopolitans and vodka. Um, so he had, to, we actually, the Canadian whiskey industry contracted uh, by 40% in sales uh, during his tenure. And unfortunately for Mike, he, he, he really only truly got innovating at the post end of his career um, with uh, the Northern Border Collection, as you know today. Uh, they called it the Whiskey yeah. Guild at the time that he did uh, Pike Creek Law 40. Um, so he brought that in ahead. So he 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 can only de develop based on age or at the tail end, right in the late 2000s or certainly or 1990s. Then Dave Doyle was the blender just before me, and Dave brought probably consistency more to whiskey than anybody else. Uh, okay. He brought he brought it into the electronic age. Um, so he he. He put recipes electronically. We can blend uh, using computer programming. Dave was absolutely brilliant at it. And, you know, I'll, I'll face my issues. I don't know what I'll be known for as a blender. Uh, th that story's still still to be written, I think. It's being written, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I think, yes, the, the, there's tensions. Um, there's philosophies. But I think we have to be able to adapt. And I think that, that's what I talk about with Canadian whiskey. We're very adaptable. And I can see recipes changing. I physically don't crumple up because I keep that as a record. I don't crumple up and throw it away. But yeah, have we changed recipes through the years? Yeah, yes, we have. But I think we're adapting to what consumers' tastes are looking for today. And I think that's where that's a wonderful place to be. And and I, as anything in life, I think, Dolph, if you benchmark, if you want to call it benchmarking, is I don't know if it's the right word, but if you take the best from each of them, that makes you a better better blender. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Right. And, and and same thing family wise. You can take the best in family. You can take the worst too. I don't know what I got. <laughs> I'm not sure. But but the, the, I think if you're a smart blender, that's the way you, you got to learn. I mean, uh, and I and we talk about mis mistakes and issues that come up, and oh yeah, write it down so that you know what I actually don't find writing down works. It's the storytelling. We talked okay. about that last week. You you got to yeah. verbally tell. And I make a conscious effort of uh, the what may be the blender in the next era. I, I talk to my staff all the time, and, and I know they get exhausted and roll their eyes at me. I'm sure, <laughs> but I want to make sure they understand what my thoughts are and and how they may steer the ship in the future. Who knows? But at least they knew where I was coming from. How long were you essentially like the number one, knowing that you were taking over the role? Uh, so I how knew, long did you uh, know and, and adapt to that before you actually turn the corner? Do you think? Not very long, actually. Probably, well, probably okay. less than a few months. But, uh, but I knew how to do the job. Uh, we had more than one person that knew how to do do the job, um, and I was okay. fortunate enough to be, I guess, tapped on the shoulder. I guess, and uh, will you be willing to take on this job? And, uh, and that's kind of how it, how it worked out, actually. So, uh, I, I, we're not we're not silly. There's more than one person trained, and I got a great staff. Uh, 
uh, Scott and Natalie, if I, I don't know if they're listening tonight, but I, I can't give them enough kudos. You know, they, they, they better be. Look, they, they, and, and I, I, again, I talk about that. I'm, I'm precluding the next bite, you, and you, you don't be a good blender unless you have the right-hand man. The right hand woman, right? In yeah. either case, right? Yeah. Uh, that's like a PhD and a master student relationship, right? Uh, that that's 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 the kind of way it is. Am I doing the blending day to day? No, I can do it in my head and tell them what to do, and 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 they're at the point now they probably could do the same thing too. So that's my job is to get them to that point, right? It is, but then you have to hold on to them too because then they want to go <laughs> yes. somewhere else, and they want you, you yeah, get to a point not, but... where you want to be the creator. I I think right. The, mm -hmm. the, it's got to happen. You you want to step out of the shadow and just do it yourself. So you either have to pick the type of person that loves you to death and they're never going to leave you, or you have to give them something. So so what do you do to give them? Uh, is it you're just giving them more leeway to to create? Yeah, I, I I give them the latitude in creating a, a lot of different things. I mean, uh, okay. the law forty p to quarter cask. Sure, so that's yeah. advice from from people. I know. Uh, Scott, who's uh, helped me with the uh, J.P. Weiser's dissertation, he was fantastic. Uh, you know, going back and forth uh, as sounding boards and what we should do with the with that uh, and and how we should release it. Uh, um, yeah, it's 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 a good relationship, um, and I like to, uh, certainly keep them engaged. I, li I like to get them out to do whis whiskey tastings, but uh, they got their own day to day jobs uh, as well. That's very critical. So. Okay. It's a good group, and we do rely on everyone to and put, to pull their own weight, and and it's not just the blenders in our. I do rely on, on our master distillers and and everything as well. To it, it's a it, yeah, it's a team. It's a team effort in the end. I mean, when one falls down, the rest falls down with it. So, and it, it's uh, it's it's there's a lot. I I talk about it too that it's, there's a lot of skills required to make whiskey. You think from agronomy to microbiologists to engineers to uh, physicists to biologists to chemists, uh, I mean, packaging people, it's like, it's just, just a lot of logistics people. I mean, there's a lot. And yeah, IT is very lot. important now. Yeah. IT, because it's all digital. It's all digital now, right? Like, like I said, my previous master with Dave Doyle, he brought the digital era to, to whiskey, which was, I mean, phenomenal. He, he it's, uh, there's a lot of skill to make whiskey if you think about it. It's not simple. <laughs> no, I can agree. And the larger the corporation, some people think that the less people are kind of involved no, because no, it's mechanized. No, no. But no, it, no, it's, it's not. It's That's not reality. No. no. All right, we're gonna we're gonna hit another another uh, quote for you. So you mentioned yep. two elements that shape distilling at various times in Canadian whiskey history. So uh, the first. I'll do the first, ask the question, go to the second one. So the government can, uh, constraints force producers to add tanks and set the scenario for whiskey producers naturally to evolve into blending recipes. So this reminds me of the taxation and malt in Ireland, which prompted them to be innovative with their unmalted barley. So I'm wondering, can you think of another government initiative other than making you uh, – matured for one, two, or three years later that changed the game of distilling in Canada. What changed the game of distilling, and I keep coming back to it, and you've heard Davin talk about it, was the American Civil War. That was just so critical. Um, 19, or 1861 to 1865, the U.S. North and the U.S. South uh, went to war with one another. Um, that, that left a void in Canadian whiskey producers uh, took advantage of that situation and started to sell it. And they went from very significantly nothing, very little tax, le 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 very little things. They were hardly keeping themselves afloat. But then all of a sudden this came and they were making money hand over fist. And sure enough, the government took notice. They could see within that period of uh, that decade from the 1860s how fast alcohol actually evolved in Canada and, and the government wanted their lion's share. They didn't even collect taxes from people. They, that was the only source of income. And sure enough, they started taxing more and more and they wanted records. They needed to prove it out in records. They wrote stuff. This is the first time you start to see, write stuff down. Yeah. That's the earliest because record. They had, had 1870s. They had to prove it. That was the law at that, at that point. After 1870, they started to write things down. Sure enough, when they had to write things down and, and they wanted, and then the 1870s had its own pressure because the world went in global depression. Actually, the, the world went in global depression and that actually caused other uh, spirit producers to put product into Canada. So again, the Canadian government had to react and say, yes, we've got to age Canadian whiskey to make it seem like a premium product. And they started putting tariffs in place. 
right? Um, that is the biggest thing, and it forced it. That American Civil War was the trigger to the government intervention into what we do, and we had to write down how much grain, how much liquid, how much barrels, and, and, and by the time you hit up in 1890, you now actually start to see blending. I don't think if that those rules ever went into place and the, the forcing of writing records down and the taxation, I, I'm not sure when blending would have ever started. I, I really think it was a natural force. It naturally Maybe prohibition after. And, and you say this is the bigger one than prohibition for Oh, it's actually And I agree. And, yeah. and, and, you, and you can see that. But I think this set them up for prohibition. And, and this leads me to a question as yeah. well. I've never brought this up with you before, so I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, have you ever read in any of the records what the relationship was between the Canadian and the American government during prohibition time? Because they're trying to stop the input of alcohol. They know it's coming from Canada. The government's making money off of this booze that's going into the States illegally. Um, yeah. Have you ever read anything? Yeah, there, there's some. There's some I, again, I, t I talk about it in my first book. <laughs> Actually, you did no, this last I'm week. <laughs> I, I, I talk about it in the, in the first book where their tax laws were in place where they said selling alcohol to any European country, I think, was nine cents a gallon, but selling it in, inside of Canada, it was like a, a dollar a gallon. So there was incentive to sell it externally, but they could never prove the records. And really? a lot of Canadian distillers got caught. And that's where Hiram Walker's grandsons were forced to sell their distillery because they were caught between, they lived in the U.S., right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and they yeah, yeah. realized that they were avoiding the tax by sending it to Cuba, apparently. <laughs> but me, really? at, at nine, cents, nine cents a gallon versus a dollar. And then the, finally the government caught up to them. Uh, because there was excise officers just stamping, yeah, it's going to Cuba, it's going to Cuba, it's going to, and they caught up to them. And they, hey, you guys owe back taxes, so you're going to get caught and go to and pay them or and fine and go to jail. But in the meantime, you live in the U.S., you can't have anything to do with alcohol. So yeah. they they were caught between two countries and caught between places. That's what forced them to actually sell the distillery uh, in uh, 1927. We forced them, and a lot of them got caught between this tax incentives and forcing to pay. They finally caught up to them, and there were people inside of Parliament. It was a big scandal in the 1926 and in, in, uh, in, inside the government of Canada. And that's all in this book right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah all right. So I, I should have read this first. I know. I'm sorry, Don. I'm that's sorry. Okay. You, you got me. I should have done that. But you know what? I got time over the holidays, and you know what? It's a quick read. It really is. So, which yeah. is nice. And yeah. uh, well, the, the history I, I've yeah. delved in quite a bit. And, but I think and then I show the early recipes in the Blending 101, the very first recipes in yeah. Canada, which I think is very interesting into what they were doing inside a Canadian whiskey. They were adding and caramel I'm coloring. Ask you about the tea and and the sugar. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For if I don't know if that's your next Actually, question. You know what? Let's do that now. I know it's later yeah. on and stuff. Yeah. I've done it, but the tea and the sugar. Uh, what was the yeah. tea covering up specifically? do you think, and the sugar covering up specifically, and what took the place of both tea and sugar? Was it just the barrel or the caramelizing the barrel? So this is where we first start seeing blending, right? So you would yeah. have a distilled spirit, well, that was part of the recipe, and mm -hmm. then they were putting in rum and tea, so they would blacken the tea and put it in, and tea was a very popular drink. So they're a scent probably making flavored whiskey back in that era. So they were putting this little bit of a tea flavor in it because people enjoy tea, and of course, okay. sugar is going to smooth it out. I'm sure they had some harsh notes. People like sugar, a little bit of sugar okay. in your tea, and, and that's what they were exactly doing. And then we're putting caramel coloring, which I find is amazing in my mind. That You know what? They were making way caramel way back in, in the 1800s. Absolutely. So when people come to me and say today, oh, yeah, is there caramel coloring? It's always been done. It's always been done. It's part of it. And, and I talk about it in the book, how we evolve into how the recipes and, and people talk. I know you're probably going to talk about the 909 as well at some point. But yeah, but this this was this was the predecessor to the 909 blending in Canadian whiskey. This blending was done from the very, very start. This is what we are. This is where we came from. And, it's and our I, history. And I it's think, our culture. Yeah, and I think this is the motivation yeah. right in the book is to, and if you really see it, that this is why Canadian whiskey is the way it is today. There are reasons for it. And people think it's, you know, you put them in and you get che cheating or you add this stuff. Or that. No, it was always there. It was always there. 
And that was, again, the motivation of writing the book to, to educate people. Yeah. The, the, and I know it's bizarre opening up my old recipe books and throwing, throwing recipes. I, I put recipes in the book. No, it was cool. <laughs> 20 years ago, you would have never done that as a, as a whiskey producer in Canada. They're very secretive, but uh, we, we've seen yeah. things open up. Right. And the, and the lot, people want to know where their whiskey comes from and, and all that. Right. I like it. It's fun. I've got several questions about the notes you saw. Uh, just quick answer yeah. to this one, though. Hard to read, or could you figure out over time? Because I find some of these notes, you 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 can read what I'm not seeing, and I can. I'm a teacher. I know what bad handwriting looks like, and I'm trying to decipher some of the notes that come onto these things. I think you get to know the previous master blenders kind of personally through reading through their notes. I think to be able to comprehend it. Yeah, though they're all handwritten notes. It's a old, old books, old, old books falling apart. But you can actually see, uh, you know, famous Canadians like Harry Hatch signing off on formulas, and his son Cliff That's Hatch. Nice. You can see the yeah. signatures. You can see these owners approving formulas, and they were in charge at the time. It was like, it's very interesting. Though they're they were kept in orderly fashion. You can see them experimenting. You can see them changing entry proof into into the casks and things like that. I mean, the, these guys were, I mean, innovators. <laughs> I mean, Canadian whiskey is beautiful. You know, I'm passionate yeah. about it. <laughs> well, I, I like Hatch just about the best. It, it's his history and his, how yeah. he comes his nose at somebody. I, I, I like the Rebel. I really do. And, and yeah, Hatch yeah. Is it. yeah. All right. Second question about the two elements that shape distilling various times. And and you said this, another quote. I'm going to throw quote, 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 quote. So this is just speculation. But I believe the addition of oats in a mash bill have resulted from livestock feed leftovers. Making an alcohol was one way to turn it into a more valuable product. You've said this many times. People use whatever was available to them at the time. Uh, I use oats in brewing because I love the enhanced mouthfeel. But when I read this, this sorry, this is my brewer part, but I don't get a difference in the palate from oats. Do you? I just I've question. I've never actually played with oats uh, in in my oh, career oh, no, and I've gotten samples and people have tried to sell me some oats and I have played maybe on it, but I've never brought it to life. I just don't think it resonates with the current today whiskey consumer. I don't okay. see many oat whiskeys out there. There may be some. I'm not trying to slight anybody here. Uh, there may be some out there, but uh, I, I I get the a sense. A lot of that, Irish whiskeys are doing it now. Yeah. a lot of especially they, new new distilleries coming out. They are yeah. Yeah, I, I I don't have anything with oats, and my and my sense is the only reason why they're doing it way back in the day was just to get rid of it. They had to feed horses; they weren't driving cars around back in eighteen hundreds. So, uh, Don, the four grain from uh, Gooderham and Warts. What's the four grains then? Sorry, I thought oats was included in that. It's corn, not. wheat, rye, and barley. Wheat, it's wheat. Sorry, yeah, my thing. Yeah. Okay, the, that's the mouthfeel I got from that was the wheat. Okay, yeah. uh, this is a long this is a long question. Stick with me. I'm sorry. It's a yeah, long no, no okay, because you mentioned, and I have several questions about the golden age of distillation from 1830s to 1890s that you talk about, and I think it's kind of cool. But this reminds me of the movie Midnight in Paris with Owen Wilson. Did you ever see this movie? No, no. Okay, <laughs> it, it, it's one of his better movies. It's, it's pretty good. And when I, I'm going to go to Paris with a, a school group, I make them watch this movie because there's so many different parts of Paris in it that we like mm. focus on. I've been anyway, to Paris. So He's he's an author on vacation in Paris, and he's, uh, he's having a hard time with his wife, doesn't like the relationship or where it's going, and he wants to write. And he walks around at midnight to get inspiration, and it's midnight, and he gets picked up from uh, a car, and he gets transported back to the 1920s. And this is his Paris L'Age d'Al. So this is his golden age, kind of what you think this golden age is. So I'm making the parallel between it. And then what he and he considers it the best time in their history because Picasso, Dolly, Hemingway, uh, Cole Porter, Fitzgerald, Josephine Baker, all the people he idolizes is back in this time. And Adriana, the woman that he's falling for, at she is brought back in time as well. And she goes to something called the Betty Puck. With, and she sees Gauguin, Degas, and two guys that she idolizes. And when they talk to these guys, in her kind of her bringing back into their period, these two guys talk about the Renaissance. So I'm wondering, do you think that we are right now? And I, I would contend that we are. We're in a type of golden age now, in my opinion. So 
Well, I don't know if we recognize it, and I want to know if you think we're in a type of golden age. People will look back because whiskey sales going up, innovation going up, what we're doing with single barrels like you today going up. You haven't done that in a long time, you said. The 100 yeah, well, years. Or so, well, uh, the years last time they did was they sold, sold it by the barrel. Uh, so that would be 1890s. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. so are we in a golden <laughs> age right now? Because I think beer and whiskey are. For me in my opinion i'm not sure about other spirits because I, I just don't know enough about them but i'm gonna ask you that because i really want to know your opinion think of it I, i'm not sure I, I i think if you think about sales and momentum you'd probably put the 1970s because that's where you saw the growth of the hiram walker distillery right they they i mean built distilleries they they yep. made us as big as we are today in the 1970s um, one could argue that was the golden age because that's where I actually put Canadian world whiskey internationally everywhere. Um, I don't know, but, but, but I come back to the golden age. I just said in my book, I come back to the golden age. It was that 1860s that really put us on the map. I mean, it really have, put us on the I map. I don't, I don't know if we would have ever become anything like we are today without it. I think that was the golden age is the pioneers sure. of Walker, Corby, uh, all those good Hammond warts, all of them. I think that was the golden age. They, they well, put just us like you're on the master map. blenders and distillers. You've got people that have landed you on a certain step and you build off of that step. Yeah. I think now with you and, and what's going on in Canada and I'll just bring the book here. 200 distilleries in Canada right now. When's the last time we had 200 distilleries in Canada? That was before uh, they started taxing yeah. everybody yeah. to death at one point right yeah about 1860 1860 when they had about over 200 distilleries and that, and that was a, sm a lot sm smaller population too today yes. you got 37 million people they had about over 200 distillery registered ones uh probably with about 2 million people so 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 distilleries you... per, per per capita and then i could still if you're saying that then the argument becomes the 1860s right Oh, I'm not saying that wasn't a golden age. I'm going to say that was a golden age, just like the Renaissance was a golden yeah. age for everybody. Yeah. But I think that was a stepping stone. And I think we can consider what we're in now because we are being very innovative around, around Canada, around the world right now. So I think 50 years from now, someone's going to be quoting you and what's going on. And maybe they come back to the show and they show the little clip of us talking about the golden age. Yeah. I, that's how I, that's how I end my book. I said, It'd be interesting if the next master blender or maybe a few master blenders down the road, what did Don Livermore do to the industry? What would they say? Yep. I, I don't, I don't know what they'll say. Um, well, these are good things to think about too, because you're, yeah. you're thinking about the future and what you want to build in the future. Not, it's not just right now. It's, it's what's going to go on later on. I like that. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, well, talking about innovation, let's do this. The the black sea cask mm -hmm. that we both have in our, our glasses right now, because it's a uh, it's different from what I'm remembering in the summer. So it, it's, it's yeah, it, it's a single cask grab. I, I don't the whiskey yeah. probably shouldn't change in in the bottle that we gave you. It should be the same. Um, mm. It may be just the moment. Uh, uh, things. Well, like I that. drank it. There was only. <laughs> Well, maybe, left. yeah, maybe there's the, some some vaporization has gone in in the in it at that time, so maybe it's vented a little bit. I don't, I don't think for the most part it changed a whole heck heck of a lot, but it, it is it is it is lot forty uh, aged. Uh, I first aged it in American bourbon barrels, and I take it out of the bourbon barrels, and then I usually put it in brand new virgin oak. But that's usually how we make lot forty. But in the case of this, we sourced uh barrels from the black sea region of the world so it's right around the russia area and apparently it's a tighter grain uh should give a different flavor profile i find it's got an interesting furfural is a co compound i actually find that comes to the for forefront in this one which is a little bit of a cherry uh kind of flavor to it uh okay. rich in the wood the caramel uh caramel type of types of notes uh i'm quite enjoying it myself actually uh i'm winding down for vacation so it's uh uh, it's a beautiful whiskey, and I uh, hope at some point we can release it, maybe under the single cask release, or or maybe as a bigger long long term release. Uh, we're not sure yet. We really haven't haven't gotten that far ahead with it yet. You'll see how this single cask release goes, and then maybe this after it. But, yeah, maybe at some point. Yeah. I hope so. It tastes pretty darn good to me. <laughs> yeah. It is. I really like the nose, Don. I've been I've been nosing it longer than I've been 
well drinking it but it does maybe it's the heat in my hand too because i'm swirling and it's heated up over the last 20 minutes too it's and so cold in edmonton though right oh my god minus 40 with the wind chill tonight no, so there you go <laughs> no with the wind chill tonight when my wife's correcting me. it's minus 40 with the wind chill tonight it's about but, 40 40 here fahrenheit <laughs> okay yeah. you're so south yes <laughs> if you look on a map and I, I take canada and i think of it in a straight line you're so far down there oh yeah yeah and we're so far up here in the i'm sure years. we're the cold weather's coming our way i'm sure if you're getting that we'll, we'll probably face some cold weather probably about four or five days <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's not so bad. it's yeah. good uh i i did want to tell I wanted to thank you uh, about this book, the math component in the book. I really like. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. If you really, really want to know how to blend whiskey, I actually I put a fictitious formula in there, just to show you how recipes are designed today, uh, yes. and how we can get so precise and consistent from blend to blend. There's ways to do it. Uh, it is very complicated. Uh, it's not easy to blend, but uh, but when you when you put it to math and how how you can actually design them. Uh, I hope uh, blenders, because there was no textbook I had could go to. There, there yeah. was no textbook when I started. Uh, and I don't know if there's any other textbook about there, how to actually blend whiskey in a, a specific type of formula. But I, I walk through one in there and design it specifically around some Canadian whiskey examples. And uh, it's re really kind of cool if you're really into that geek, geeky kind of thing. But yeah. Uh, but if it's too much math, skip over that chapter. <laughs> Pick up this and then <laughs> no and then read that and there's no math. There's, well, yeah, no, there's yeah. a little bit of math. We can, a little bit we of math. Do this. A little bit. But what I was thinking of specifically was the overproof and the underproof. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the, the original proofing scale. Yeah. Plus or minus the variance multiplied by 0 0.5706. I think it was, yeah. it was cool. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't realize that there was an original proof scale. It's not, not. it's not even the proof yeah. that you see today, but it was a proof scale that was way back in the, in the day designed around what they call it was a Sykes hydrometer. And, and Sykes was a, a, uh, a excise man from the UK. And, and they basically take advantage of the density. It's like a bobber, if you want to say. The hydrometer is what people. Yep. And, yep. Uh, that one. <laughs> and you would see whiskeys actually all the way into probably the 1970s using the original proof scale. So they would underproof and zero proof was 50 56.0 i can't remember the decimal place i'd have to open the book oh, to find okay. out yeah oh, that's, a, that's a, a natural hydrometer day that's not even what a sykes yeah. hydrometer was so no uh, not ours and and this i've got a bricks one as well and but yeah yeah no, i know but yeah I, I do talk about that the original proofing scale again something you really don't see in books i mean i didn't know that when i first started but when i started reading these recipes and looking at it these i mean the original whiskeys were sit at uh 25 under proof 25 under proof means about 42.7 percent abv the original whiskeys in canada have sat around 43 percent yep. they weren't 40 like you see today they actually sat around 43 percent at this 25 under proof and you can see Hiram walker making this 25 under proof rye whiskey for a long time he was making and, old and not rye mandated whiskey. by the government either Oh, he was making old happened. rye whiskey in Dolph. So if you go back to the recipe book, sorry, I'm getting up from the camera here. So no, please my, do. My this is the oldest recipe in Canada. The special old, yeah. Hiram Walker special old. It's the oldest whiskey. He was always making old rye. That was his original recipe. Uh, and I can date that back all the way from the beginning, which is kind of cool uh, as, as it's, and we still yes. make it today. So uh, if you there ever see that it. bottle on the shelf, yep. it's, it's, a, it's a standard, you know, you know uh three four year old whiskey but it's uh okay. it's been there forever yeah, since we you started know, anyway. and i should and i was thinking about that and i would say a blending whiskey but i don't blend anything i, I make one blend i uh you make a couple but i make a rusty nail that's the <laughs> only thing I really like. that's it and uh yeah so a couple questions coming out of that bottle and and their other distillery as well because i interviewed the leopold brothers and they had the three chamber rye and they got that the three chamber rye that they just revived and remade and it came from the plans from that plant and i'm the wondering plant? If, yeah yeah with the taxes and, in yes and th they figured it out because of the tax system and uh and they reviewed the taxes and a, a couple of papers that were made on the taxes and this is in the 1920s what they were making 
and it was mostly three chamber rot. And I'm wondering if that was something similar to it, because I know you're using the beer still, which they used then. But did they have any mention to the three chamber rot? It's all in there. <laughs> For God's sakes. All right. All right. They, talk, they talk about the, that time Walker's original still was going through a three chamber uh, beer still. And then they just evolved today. Today, our tr there's 34 trays, I think, on our still today. So they just wow. kept adding trays, kept adding trays, kept adding trays, and eventually, until you see what we see today. And I think probably a standard beer still was probably, I can, this guy can tell by the proofing. Pro I'm, I'm thinking it was probably around the 1880s at some point. Was what you'd probably okay. see the, the standard beer still you'd see today. It's I I can't I've never seen the physical drawings, but I'm just guessing by the proof they were coming off a still. I'm 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 thinking that that's probably where they started adding more and more trays. But he's right. They're right. There was original three chamber beer still uh, that he was using right in the late 1850s, and and they probably evolved and evolved it. By the book, it'll answer all the questions <laughs> I'm answering right now. Uh, or, uh, I need to go back to well not. Yes, back to this yep, one, blending. but back yeah. to the question we had about the tea. And you said people yep. like the flavor of the tea, but I was wondering, uh, is it always additive or was it subtractive sometime? Like just taking away a flavor as opposed to... Oh, I don't know if they take it away. It'd probably It would cover up a flavor probably, right? It's, okay, you're so. probably adding tea to probably covering up some bad notes to it. Now that stopped from what I could tell the, the, the tea... I don't see it in recipes uh, around the 1900s. So they okay. must have formalized the definition of Canadian whiskey probably in that point. And then you can't add sugar anymore. You can't add tea anymore. But the caramel coloring stuck. And then the blenders that that 10% uh, you could add in uh, two-year-old spirit or wine as well. Uh, I talk about that in the yeah. book that uh, uh, it later evolved into 9.09%. .09%. So they always were blending in 10%. So they make a whiskey at 100% and they added 10% on top of it. That was 110. 10 divided by 110 is 9.09%. .09%. And I start, start, they actually formalized that in the 1990s. But they always did the 10% above, 10% above, all the way up until the 1980s. Uh, and then the government put a little more formalized in the legislation about that time. And I think I put that question further into the after drown because I wanted to find yeah, okay. out what our other distillers wanted to have or say about that as well. Uh, yeah. And, and and really interesting. Sorry, I'm going to switch gears. I, I'm, I'm coming back <laughs> okay. to you reading these recipes because I'd really like to know what goes on in your mind when you read a recipe. So if you're reading something, let's say for the first time or you're deciphering it for the first time, are you thinking... Uh, I've made this, I make something like this. Are you comparing it to what you do or are you trying to picture what it tastes like? Like where does your mind kind of initially go before? When I make something from scratch? Or, no, when when you're reading something for the first time. Oh, uh, reading an old recipe. Read yeah. an old recipe. Um, yeah, so I got to do a little bit of digging. And so inside the recipe books, they do talk about how some of these things were distilled. Uh, you could see... Uh, how what type of grains they were using um they didn't talk a lot about barrel types back in the day uh i think that's more maybe that's that's my add to this to this equation of canadian whiskey we probably do a lot more barrel types than we ever ever had uh but back in the day they were probably just used barrels over and over again or once used bourbon barrels you didn't see them using sherry butts or things like that um because they're probably we were using that 10 percent blender the new, there was no need to right um so right and the pack serrette, we're going to talk yeah, about there, that. There, yeah, there, there was no need to to finish in a sherry barrel because because uh, you were adding sherry. They were adding prune wine. They were adding all kinds of wine and things, right, to to these whiskeys in that area. And they, they thought probably, why should I go and buy a sherry? And, and probably they couldn't sell them across the ocean quite readily either, quite honestly. So um, so maybe that's my era. Maybe that's what I brought to Canadian whiskey is all these barrel finishings that uh, that were never, ever done you know, within within our walls. But when I look at a recipe, so I have to decipher a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can I can probably match them fairly close, uh, to, to be quite honest with you. I can tell when it's a base whiskey. I know the, 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 the names and what they were doing. I could tell probably the rye whiskeys on there were making. They are probably just call them distilling a rye whiskey. Uh, probably not many people are using pot stills in those areas, so I, I can match things. Now, there's there's ingredients I can't find anymore. Um, the first edition of of the Gooderham and Warts that Mike Booth made in 1998, he was he was buying a Scotch and putting it into it, 
uh, okay. and that distillery is no longer with us. So that if you, anyone ever found the original Good or Haven Warts, there's no way I could ever re replicate it. And we just made a, a, a new recipe under what my my vision and version was. So um, I, I, I can match them within reason if the ingredients are still around. But that problem, so, sometimes you can't find the ingredients anymore. <laughs> so that's where you go, though? You're thinking, can I make this this way? Or I, I guess I'm wondering if you're thinking about the replication or thinking about improving or thinking I already make something better than this or are you thinking are you critical it's like why would you use that because when no, I read something yeah I, I, I probably I, I, pro I don't go back and recreate the rest I can I have but I've never commercially made something uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I go forward and what is the market looking for today, Dolph, quite honestly. Yeah. I look at the, uh, like a Gooder Hammond Warts, little Trinity. It's a brand new recipe. I look at the Pike Creek Olo Rosso 21 year, brand new recipe, dissertation. Those are recipes for today's drinker. Um, yeah. right. Legacies like that. I got the 22 year Pike or the uh, 22 year Wisers here in a port barrel. I, I mean, I start, I, I make new recipes for today. I really don't go backwards, to be honest with you. I can read them and understand them, but I, I've never really commercially made one, to be honest with you. All right. It's good. I'm just wondering yeah. where the mind goes. When I read, my mind's everywhere. I didn't know if you could. No, no, I know, but I just, that was their era. That's what they wanted to drink. They they liked lighter, smoother whiskeys. They, at that time, today, people want bold and, and lots of flavors and complexity. They want a lot going on. That's well, what the trend 40. is today. Yeah. The Lock 40. I don't know if it's your best seller, but it, it's it's in my it's my favorite. It's that one? This one is one of my favorites. And that just can't I don't have that bottle yet. So one and beyond tomorrow. Cask. We've already planned it. it. My vacation started as well. So my <laughs> wife knows that my first day is going around and buying some stuff. So you enjoy that dram, but I'm going to ask you another question because certain ports of the country get certain loses. You talk about this in there. So I find it really interesting that you were blending for different markets then. Mm, yeah. Way back when. So that really surprised me. I know you do it now, but I, I was thinking that. Did you read anything further that would give you an indication of the preferences for different countries, for different provinces and cities, does anything like kind of stand out that was different? That you it's more that's more reading the audience when I'm at in these places. To be honest with you, is you can tell how, what, which one they're drinking, which the ones their eyes are lighting up. Um, I, I can tell in Texas they like sweeter, smoother whiskeys. Uh, New York sweeter. they like the rye, rye. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They like the light, lighter, sweeter, smoother whiskeys. Um, uh, in Europe. They, they really like the Pike Creek rum barrel finish. Really like it. It does very well there. Nice blended light. Uh, we got a Wiser's 10 year that is extraordinary there. Uh, hopefully we can see it in Canada at some point or in the US, but the, the 10 year is a phenomenal blend. Um, okay. it, it does very well in Sweden, actually, of all places. It does very well in Germany. Um, uh, so you do see different places and a largely probably a little bit on sales a little bit on gut instinct in when I'm doing whiskey taste like yours uh, and with whiskey clubs you can tell which regions like what uh, to be honest with you yeah well and we talk a little bit before the tastings as well and I usually say I really want the lot 40 quarter cast because <laughs> yeah. the, the, the two times we had it, I loved it and wanted it but uh let's go back to them because they couldn't read their audience. They still had to see what was yeah. selling in different places. I'm wondering, one, did you have salesmen going from place to place trying to promote a certain drink or or telling you what they liked better? And two, how did they figure it out to actually know that they were doing different things for different things? I don't know. That's I, I, You got right. me stumped. You got me stumped All on right. that question. Um, you could see them making... Of whiskeys at that point, they were doing cast strength whiskeys at that point, which was very odd. I mean, oh, like, yeah, I mean, they I, they were doing cast strength whiskeys in the 1880s, which was crazy to think. Um, and he had a number of them, Hiram Walker. He, he probably had a dozen or so recipes that he was making. I don't know. I, I don't have the sales records to know where, where they were going okay. specifically. So I can't can't answer the question or whether they were regional or who they were selling to. I, I, I really, really don't know. I do know that the rye 25 under proof, the, that, that old rye was was the, their biggest seller, uh, at least very early on. Uh, and right. then obviously Canadian okay. Club took off in the, in the 1900s. But yeah. Well, then let's ask you when it kind of changed. Because if you look at what's behind me, we've got... Uh, 
the sorry. Let's, let's I mean, I'm going to answer Kent's so question is, here. What Eastern Canada and Western Canada? Yeah, so um, we're doing that. We've got this. We got seven green. We got several things. So I'm wondering when you went that direction. Eastern Canada, I, I would think they're probably more like Europe, where they probably like a rum barrel finish or a wine barrel finish. Uh, you got the Quebec provinces and the Eastern. Eastern's in the rum already. They, we sell more lambs rum in, in Newfoundland. I think those would be the two places there. I think Ontario, uh, uh, Alberta, BC is very similar. They like good blends. I mean, they really like tasty blends. That seems to be their their thing. Although we're seeing a turning point with 100% rise, like Law of 40. So that that is changing. I think the the uh, there are drinkers in of those three area regions, the the central Ontario and uh, uh, Western Canada. That you're starting to see momentum on on Lot 40 in these unique finishes. So I don't see a lot of difference between Ontario uh, on, but the eastern part they're probably more into the smoother style style styles of whiskey. How about Maritimes? Do you have a do you have a big section in the Maritimes that just no, not overly people? big. Wiser's Wiser's and Bright Creek will probably be your two biggest sellers for us there. Okay. Uh, again, that smoother style uh, is is there, but r- the rum by far. This I know this is about <laughs> this is about whiskey tonight, but rum by far okay. still is uh, the Lambs brand does very very well there. When did you start doing it for different provinces? So I've got these two because I like. Well, I don't change lot. recipes in the under the same brand, right? But when did you decide I'm going to make something different for uh, uh, I, we, BC we, and for the the I think this is Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Say that they approach us. The liquor boards approach us. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if Alberta wants their own whiskey, I know this is your uh, got an Alberta audience. Excuse me. Yeah. I had to put the the sneeze <laughs> button on there. Um, yeah, I'll, so if, if anybody's in the Alberta uh, liquor boards here, um, yeah, phone me, please. Uh, I'd love to do a, a, a small blend for the Alberta market. Uh, but they approached me, uh, uh, each of those provinces, to do a special blend with them, and I worked with their brown spirits. Okay. Because I, I thought that was a continuation of what you were mentioning happened in the past. No, 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 you no, noticed no, that were... there was different taste and you'd started. There is, different... there is. But in those cases, those were uh, specific projects and releases that they, they approached us on. So, uh, so, so it works both ways. Uh, those are good customers of ours. So uh, we stand up and listen. Okay. All right. Excellent. And we've got 552. So we're going to, we're, we're going to round this off pretty quick and then we're going to get other people on so any last comments from you don before we go on because i'm done my lot 40 black sea cask and i i would say spicier it's it seems oh, spicy yeah. compared to that night for some reason and and maybe my memories are just off i enjoyed it when we did this in the summer but now it just speaks to me and you can see if i don't drink it quickly that's that's a bigger compliment than me drinking because <laughs> I'm just enjoying yeah. the nose on it's fantastic. No, I, I'm glad you enjoyed the read, Dolphin. I hope you you learned something. And uh, I know we really I don't know if this is for the second hour, but I do get into some some marketing things that uh, that are out there. I talk about caramel coloring and I talk about marrying whiskey and things like that and, and shell filtration, uh, which are hard topics uh, to talk there. about. Yeah, it, and it's all in that book and and. Is it for real? Some of those things, or or are they just marketing things? And, and I talk about my point of view on it, um, which is interesting. And you know, I, I do a science approach on it, as I as you'd expect from me, Dolph. Yep. Uh, in, in terms of what what those are, and, and are what are people really asking of you, and they don't really know what they're what they're asking for. So. Uh, and then, then I talk about a little bit some sensory stuff, which is which is interesting too. How and how you actually go into some sensory analysis, which is which is. I, I'm glad you could like the book, though. <laughs> I was thinking from last week that the, the second half of the book is a little bit different than the first half on the blending oh, no. 101. But it's but I, but I hope I hope I bring some of those things to light. And like I said, I haven't really seen anybody talk about it in a book before. And if anybody's looking to buy the book, go to jpwiserstour.ca. Um, that is a, the website which we we do uh, sell them at. We don't have them on chapters or anything like that. Just go to jpwiser2.ca and they'll they'll ship them to you. Uh, they're thirty dollars a book, 
And like I said, uh, we're not doing a lot of marketing behind it. We're kind of just letting it naturally sell themselves and word of mouth. And they, they seem to be at a steady pace. We just seem to keep keep selling them. And I think as people dig into it and, and programs like this one, Dolph, I really thank you for, for uh, at least giving me a, an hour to, to talk about me. Thank you. No, we're yeah. having a great time. Whenever I can get the author to just spill his guts about everything, it's fantastic. Yeah, How yeah. often do you get this chance in life to have the Dr. Don Livermore in front of you, asking him questions, plum- pummeling him with just an incessant amount of questions, really? And uh, I don't know. You've only told me to, to to read the other book three times. There's only been three <laughs> questions I've asked since they go back to the other one. But it's going to change in the next one. And it's going to be great. Uh, we've got two other distillers coming on. And I wanted to do that with the cold uh, chill filter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wanted well, to that's kind of add this, get other people's opinions too, because sure. I know what mine is. I know what yours is. And if you read the book, you're going to get it. And uh, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pretty happy with everything that's gone on it's we've had uh, a a mano a mano question peppering situation and uh, i'm happy to do it for another hour yeah you know and and i I know those are hard questions though those topics but i think they need to be addressed i I think i don't know if there's a there's a fear out there a little bit i'm not not addressing with other distillers or they're not quite sure how to answer it but again if you if you really think about and do a science approach like you know i know i would um there it's it's good but uh and and certainly i would say uh, as the holiday season approaches certainly think of a canadian whiskey as a gift uh i know we make world winning stuff uh uh for me <laughs> selfishly uh wiser's lab 40 pike creek or good ham awards i certainly give a bottle of those and uh and, and, and then turn turn your friends uh on to the good stuff in canada you know uh, we do good things here and, and we should be proud of it and we are on this show we I know. Definitely. I know you. Are. Well, we love it, and uh, we're gonna sign off. So, whiskey okay. brothers and sisters and friends, that's the second of two whiskey book clubs based on this book right here, Blending One Hundred and One. It's a lovely book, Christmas present. And you know what? Uh, if you're not in Canada, we can. You'll still get the book. You, you can still you can. still get it on. I don't know if you'll ship before Christmas, but I don't know. Yeah, you probably won't get it before Christmas, but uh, hey, uh, we we might be reading. uh, Yeah. (laughs) We're moving our conversation from this, I say more formalized, I don't know how formal this is, to a less formalized situation, conversation style in the after dram, where everyone gets to ask any question they want, really, back and forth. Dr. Don, and we've got Don. DeMonte from Last Straw, and we've got Steve Lee from Douglas with us. And Blair might be in, and because he had the shot today, so he might be in, he might not be in. And uh, it should be fun. It should really, it really be. be fun. And and what else would you do on a Friday night to start your vacation, for some of us anyways, than, than listening to people talk about whiskey and drinking whiskey yourself? So we'll okay. be back. Okay. We'll see you on the other ten. side, Dolph. Five minutes after Dram. You don't want to miss it. Like, subscribe, and we're going to see you all soon. Thank you very much, Don. I'll see you on the other side, buddy. Bye. Ciao.